So, uh, Revelation chapter 4, the title of our sermon this evening, Before the Throne of God, uh, singing that hymn tonight, it's nice. Before the Throne of God, Revelation chapter 4, we're going to read verses 1 through 11 for context. So hear the word of God with me. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take, must take place after this. Immediately I was in the spirit, and behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow around the throne, in appearance like an emerald. Around the throne were 24 thrones, and on the thrones I saw 24 elders sitting clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. From the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Before the throne there was a sea of glass like crystal, and in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures full of eyes in front and in back. The first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third living creature had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. The four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. Whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever and cast their crowns before the throne saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they exist and were created. This is the word of God, amen. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we praise you for this, uh, this glorious glimpse into the magnificence of the heavenly throne room where you are portrayed here, Lord, in Revelation 4 as seated on the throne, the Lord of glory seated at your right hand. And we're grateful, Lord, for how this encourages our heart. And we know that that's uh, part of the intent of this segment of this letter, um, that uh, we, your people, the church militant, as we live in this world, uh, to be as lights in a dark place and to serve you as your witnesses with the gospel, um, knowing, Lord, that uh, we'll face, as our Lord and Master did, that we'll face persecution. Um, and having that understanding, Lord, or, or being presented with that reality is such an encouragement to us. Uh, let us, Lord, uh, live with our eyes fixed on eternal and unseen things in the heavenlies, that we might live for you um, in a way that glorifies you, Lord, and, and in a way and with these glorious truths that help us persevere in holiness and faithfulness to the end. We pray all these things in Christ's name, and thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. The title of our sermon this evening, Before the Throne of God, Revelation chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, our text. We'll look at verses 1 and 2 specifically this evening. Uh, so now we get into the apocalyptic section of the book, Revelation chapter 4. And as I was thinking about uh, these chapters and the chapters that follow, I thought to ask, uh, have you been keeping up with the news lately? <laughs> Uh, you ever get home and just uh, you turn on the news, sit back and sort of watch what is going on in this chaotic world in which we now live. Uh, it is crazy. Uh, there seems to be madness everywhere you look. And uh, I get, frankly, uh, tired of watching the news. I can only stand so much of it. And part of the reason that I get uh, tired of watching the news uh, is that it's grieving. And I'm not able to interact with the, 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 the news watch, watching it. It's a, it's a frustration. Um, it's so grieving. And when it's not grieving, it's maddening. Uh, we often, uh, in our sort of purview or perspective on the world, appear to see uh, chaos and madness. Um, I shouldn't be astonished by it, but I am. It is astonishing. And you add to that madness, that chaos, which we see all around us, displayed all around us, you add that, add to that the weight of your own sin, uh, the weight of your own difficulties and your battle against sin and your struggle to live for the Lord and pursue righteousness, 
Uh, with Paul, we say, oh, wretched man that I am. From Romans chapter 7, we just looked at that text. Uh, and we realize, don't we, that, that um, we are, I am a person of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. You add to that the outright hostility and the increasing hostility of people against everything that we treasure, everything that we value, that we hold dear. And much of that hostility actually coming from within the professing church and how discouraging that is. And everywhere you look, everywhere you look, it would appear as though the wicked prosper, right? Everywhere you look, it appears as though the wicked are having a heyday, uh, wreaking havoc on the planet, Uh, It appears everywhere you look as though the beast were winning. Uh, And oftentimes as Christians, when we look at our circumstances and we look at the world, that's what it appears like to us. And um, what comes to mind when I think along those lines or when I think that it appears that way is Psalm 73, where the psalmist says, uh, and he's bewailing, bewailing what he sees happening in Israel. Their strength, the wicked, the strength of the wicked appear, appears firm. They're not in trouble as we are. They're not plagued as we are. A pride serves as their necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They say, in their own words, how does God know? Is there knowledge with the Most High? In other words, they sin with impunity. They pursue wickedness like water with impunity. And in their own hearts and minds, they think that no one sees them. Uh, God doesn't see, see them. And the the psalmist, in observing all this, is tempted to throw in the towel. The psalmist is is tempted to compromise. He's tempted to sin against God. Listen to him as he responds. He says, surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, have washed my hands in innocence, he says. All day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. And he said, my feet would have stumbled I would have been untrue until, until I went into the sanctuary of God and then I understood their end. When he goes into the sanctuary of God, then he understands the fate, if you will, of the wicked, the destiny of the wicked. Well, as you think about that and you think about the purview or the perspective of the psalmist going into the sanctuary of God and understanding the end of the wicked... And make the connection now with the book of Revelation. The book of the Revelation is written, if you will, to take us by the hand into the sanctuary of God. With the psalmist, we're taken into the sanctuary of God where we, in the midst of this madness, in the midst of this world in which we live, in the midst of suffering and adversity and difficulty, in the midst of our time of tribulation, In the midst of persecution, as we seek to be witnesses for the Lord Jesus Christ, lights shining in a dark place, all those who desire to serve him will suffer persecution. And as we with the psalmist take a look at the madness that surrounds us, take a look, take a look at the the wicked as they seem to prosper in this world, what is the book, book of Revelation intended to do? The Lord, through this revelation to us, it's a revelation of Jesus Christ. He is both the agent and the object of revelation. The Lord takes us by the hand and he walks us into the sanctuary of God where there we can put a right perspective on the whole thing, right? Where there we see things as they truly are. It's there in the sanctuary of God that we see the glory of the righteous, the glory of the Lord Jesus Christ. We see God enthroned in majesty and we see the end of the wicked. Everything that is happening around us is happening within the plans and purposes of our sovereign God who rules and reigns. It's happening. Everything that happens around us, everything that's going on right now, all the madness that we see is happening for the sake of his people, the church. It's not happening despite his church or aside from his church. It's ultimately happening for the sake of his people, the church, and ultimately for the glory of his son, our Lord Jesus Christ. How do we make sense of it all, right? How do we gain a right perspective? How are we to view it? Through what lens are we to see it? The revelation of Jesus Christ gives us the filter, gives us the lens through which we should see all of the madness around us. He allows us to see it so that with the psalmist, our feet would not be made to stumble. Do you see? 
Revelation is that kind of book to the church. It's that kind of letter to the church. The intention of the letter is so that our feet in our generation, at our time, in our period of tribulation, so that our feet would not be made to stumble. Now, we can study the history of civilization, and that's good. We should study the history of civilization. Those who do not study history are bound to repeat it. (laughs) We can concern ourselves with what's going on in the world today, and we should. It's good for us to see that. We should watch the news now and then. But sometimes we can come away with a sense, watching the news or studying history or looking at our circumstances, we can come away with a sense that we play a very small part in a very large production that we play a very small part in a, in a large production that, that, frankly, in which we are little more than hapless and helpless observers of all the madness. But the concern and focal point of all that is going on in the world, even now, certainly all that was going on in the world in the first century when this letter was written, all that has gone on through the history of the church in the church age, all that is going on in our world today, The focal point of all of that is the church. God's people, the church is at the center of it all. The church is the epicenter of God's work on the planet. We're not merely bystanders. We're not hapless and helpless observers. We're at the very center of the action. At the very center of God's focus, God's intentions, as he is sovereignly dictating the circumstances of history. All of history is a love story about a hero coming to save his bride. That's history, right? Kill the dragon, get the girl. That's the the story, if you will, of the Bible. So the church, the bride, is the concern of the Lord, the bridegroom. The church is the concern of the Lord as he walks in the midst of the lampstands. The church is the concern of the Lord as he cares for us in the midst of all the madness. And he cares for us that we would persevere in faithfulness to the end as lights in a dark place that we might be with him where he is. That's his, that's his purpose. That's his intention. And what is the book of the Revelation intended to do for us? It's intended to help us persevere. It's for the church militant in her tribulation to help her persevere. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. This is to be an encouragement to us, brothers and sisters. And the Lord's concern then in this letter, being the perseverance of his bride in the midst of her tribulation, perseverance in faithfulness, perseverance as a faithful witness, the Lord's concern then is persecution from without, error and threat from a a dangerous insurgency from within, enemies to the left of her, devils to the right, and here we are stuck in the middle, (laughs) right? So the Lord sets his attention then to what we need to know in order to help us. The Lord gives us what we need, and he gives us what we need right here in Revelation 4 and 5. We need to know, as the torch has been passed to us in our generation, We need to know what we need to know that we would not be made to stumble. We need to press on in hope. We need to press on in faithfulness until our bridegroom comes for his bride. And that's the point of the book, to give his church what she needs to persevere, to give his church a hope that she can lay hold of and apprehend through faith. And what does he do? What does he do to keep us from discouragement? What does he do to keep us from despair, to keep us looking at our present and often very difficult circumstances with the right perspective. The Lord takes us by the hand and he takes us into the sanctuary of God. It's there that we see the glory of the Lord. It's there that we see the utter end of the wicked. So then, as the Lord completes his direct address to the churches, as the Lord wraps up those seven letters to those seven churches, and now he completes his direct address to those churches, which, brothers and sisters, we have to remember is an address to all the churches. Those are representative churches in a representative area, but those letters meant for us today even. As the Lord completes those direct addresses, where do we see him? Where do we see him? We see him enthroned. 
enthroned. What is the vision that we need to encourage us to lay hold on that glory, that end, that age, if you will? What do we need to see? We need to see the Lord enthroned. When stuff seems like it's burning down around us here, when things seem like they're devolving into madness and devolving into chaos, what do we need? We need a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ sitting on the throne, enthroned in glory. God the Father, sovereign over history. That's what we need to see. Verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 21. Where do we see the Lord? We see him enthroned. To him who overcomes, I will grant to sit with me on my throne as I also overcame and sat down with my father on his throne. The Lord Jesus Christ has overcome and he now calls his church, his bride, to overcome as she follows him. So what does it mean then to overcome? Overcome what? What is he referring to? We are in our generation, in our time of tribulation, we are to overcome the temptation to compromise. We are to persevere in the faith to the end under suffering. That's what it means to overcome. To persevere in the faith to the end under suffering. So what does that mean? Well, in connection with the Lord's address to the seven churches, we must persevere in steadfast love unlike Ephesus who lost her first love. Brothers and sisters, we must persevere in steadfast love for the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to be faithful, faithful even unto death like Smyrna. We're to remain vigilant against error lest we end up like Pergamos. We have to keep the Jezebels out of the church unlike Thyatira. We must maintain a living and working and thriving and healthy and watching faith unlike dead Sardis. We need to follow the Lord's example of faithfulness under suffering like Philadelphia did. We need to cling to the source of our strength and our godliness unlike complacent, comfortable Laodicea, right? Their reproofs are our reproofs. Their instruction is our instruction. Their encouragements are our encouragements. And while we press on in perseverance, Facing those difficulties, facing those trials, facing similar circumstances, while we press on in perseverance, who do we look to for help in our time of need? Who do we look to? The answer to that question is obvious, isn't it? Who, do, who can we look to as one who has gone before us and persevered through suffering to the end, to his glory? Someone who has overcome great suffering himself The answer is obvious, it's Jesus Christ. We look to Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has overcome and having overcome has now been enthroned. We look to the one who has now received the kingdom, who now reigns from heaven. Chapter one, verse five, flip the page back to the left. Chapter one, verse five, the one who is ruler over the kings of the earth. Not one one who shall be eventually, (laughs) He's the one who is ruler over the kings of the earth. He reigns now over a kingdom in which we ourselves now participate. And to the one who overcomes in him, the one who overcomes his own trial in the wilderness, to him he will grant to sit with him on his throne just as he also overcame and sat down with his father on his throne. It's a glorious promise, isn't it? The Lord Jesus Christ now enthroned in glory. So in all of our trouble, in all of our difficulty, in our adversity, in our suffering, where do we look? Where do we look? Will my perspective be tuned correctly by watching the nightly news? (laughs) No. Do I look to the Supreme Court for hope that this mess is going to be cleaned up? Absolutely not. We look to the Lord Jesus Christ, the ruling and reigning, the now ruling and reigning king. And we know that just as he received the kingdom at the end of his perseverance, we're going to look at that in Daniel chapter 7 next week, we know that just as he received the kingdom at the end of his perseverance, we also, united to him in faith, will inherit with them at the end of our perseverance, at the end of our suffering. And our future experience of that eschatological reality has already been assured to us 
chapter 1, verse 6. Does chapter 1, verse 6 say he shall make us kings and priests to our God? No. He has made us kings and priests to our God. We rule and reign even now with him. That age, the age of the new creation, that eschatological age, the age to come, has infiltrated, if you will, has invaded this present age in the kingship of the Lord Jesus Christ and in the new creation salvation, the new covenant salvation of his people. So we have every reason to be encouraged, every reason from this book to be encouraged. The book of the Revelation is meant to fuel our faith, meant to drive our faith, drive our devotion as we persevere to the end. And how does Revelation do that? Again, Revelation takes us into the sanctuary of God where we see him, where we see the Lord Jesus Christ. It's a revelation of Jesus Christ, both its source and its object. So when I'm grieved (laughs) watching the news, or I'm grieved about what we see going on in this world and just the constant outpouring of wickedness that takes place all around us, grieved by my own flesh, grieved by my own battle with sin, grieved by the devil. What do we do, brothers and sisters? Upward I look and see him there who made an end of all my sin. My life is hid with Christ on high. And Revelation gives us that perspective uh, from the heavenly throne room of God. Do you see then, think with me now, do you see that connection between the Lord's address to the seven churches and then the rest of the letter? There's a connection, Romans, uh, Revelation chapter four and five, to the letters to the seven churches. And there's a connection between those seven letters, those letters to the seven churches and the rest of the book. It's important we understand what that connection is. As each of us are tempted, we certainly will be tempted, and tempted in ways not unlike those representative churches. You may be lukewarm, like Laodicea. You may have left your first love, like Ephesus. You may be comfortable and complacent. You may be facing persecution or suffering or even death. And what do you need when you are tempted to compromise? What do you need? You need a vision of the Lord Jesus Christ enthroned in heaven reigning and ruling and sovereign over this world. Jesus Christ is on his his throne. The kingdom of God has come and the worship service in heaven has already begun. It's high time you wake up. The day is half spent and our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. That vision is meant to get you through tribulation. Amen? Now, when we get to the throne room scene then, Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter five, Both of these chapters comprise a single scene. And what's taking place in Revelation 4, Revelation 5? John describes for us what we cannot see for ourselves. We don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. By faith and not by sight. So John describes for us in these chapters what we cannot see for ourselves. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 8, listen. God has put all things in subjection under his feet. He rules and reigns. God has put all things in subjection under his feet. He left nothing that is not under him. But what does the author to the the Hebrews say? But we do not yet see all things put under him. We walk by faith and not by sight. What is it though there in Hebrews chapter 2 that we do see? What do we see? We see Jesus who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death. We see him crowned with glory and honor. Where do we see him crowned with glory and honor? On the pages of scripture, and particularly Revelation chapter four, Revelation chapter five. How do we see him? We see him through the eyes, as it were, of the apostle John in the very throne room of heaven. We don't have to read one of the the charismaniacs who claimed to have been in heaven frolicking around with Jesus in the crystal sea. We don't have to pick up one of those trash books. Don't pay money for those things. We have the Apostle John's testimony in Revelation 4 and Revelation 5. The Apostle John saw a picture of the enthroned Christ, the enthroned Lord of glory. We have his testimony. And This is reality. What is presented to us here is the reality, if you will, that sits behind all of our circumstances. No matter the circumstances that you face, the reality that exists behind those circumstances is the enthroned king, right? The Lord Jesus Christ 
on his throne, ruling and reigning. Behind all your trouble, behind all your tribulation, behind all your suffering, behind the curtain, so to speak, there is a throne room of he- in heaven and one seated upon the throne who is ruling. He executes his divine will with perfect wisdom. There are those around the throne who do not cease day or night saying, holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. That's taking place right now. (laughs) Day or night, they do not cease before the throne. Holy, holy, holy. Whatever you've got going on in the here and now, (laughs) that is the vision that we need to get us through our tribulation. Amen? Blessing and honor and glory and power be to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb forever and ever. Jesus Christ approaches the ancient of days. We're going to see that parallel in Daniel 7. He takes the scroll in his hand. And as Jesus Christ takes the scroll in his hand, what is the very next scene? Now think with me for a moment. I'll let you make the connection yourself. We're going to get there in a couple of chapters. Jesus Christ ascends into heaven. He comes to the Ancient of Days and he receives the kingdom. Here we see the Lord Jesus Christ in chapter 5 take the scroll in his hand. And what is the very next scene? He begins to break the seals and judgment is poured out upon the earth. And as these temporal judgments are being poured out on the earth, as the wrath of God, think with me now, as the wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, When we looked at that passage in Romans chapter 1, we looked at the the grammar of the text. That wrath is currently being poured out, right? That wrath is currently being revealed from heaven. And as God's people, bearing the mark of God upon their foreheads, patiently persevere in faithfulness, awaiting the return of their enthroned king, what is the reality that sits behind those circumstances to encourage them to persevere? What is the reality that they should remember as they seek to live for the Lord in faithfulness through their suffering, the reality is this, our enthroned God and the Lord Jesus Christ at his right hand. We should meditate on this text, amen? Revelation 4, Revelation 5. We shouldn't meditate on the text as a mere curiosity for what it says about creatures around the throne and objects around the throne. We should meditate upon this text for what it communicates to us about the one who is seated on the throne. (laughs) That's how Paul, for example, can say in the midst of all of his tribulation, that's how Paul can say that we're hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. Perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. After having been stoned, And just before losing his head, he calls it a momentary light affliction. Why is that? Why is that? How does Paul have that kind of perspective on his suffering? The enthroned king ruling and reigning and sovereign over this world, over all of his circumstances. That's glorifying to God, do you see? When we keep our eyes fixed upon eternal and unseen things in the heavenlies as we live for him in this life. Chapter 4, the scene then is described in two parts. The scene is described in two parts. In verses 1 through 5, we see one enthroned. Verses 6 through 11, we see his worship. Tonight, we simply want to set the context. How chapter 4, chapter 5 connected to what goes before And tonight we want to spend time in verse 1. We'll approach verse 2 and just look at the context together. So we begin with the context then in verse 1. After these things, I looked and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me saying, come up here and I'll show you things which must take place after this. Now, John opens this text, this section of text by connecting it to what comes before. The phrase that he uses to make the connection is that little clause, after these things. Now, what is John referring to when he says, after these things? John is referring to the things that he saw and heard in chapters one, two, and three. 
It's a chronological marker, if you will, after these things. In chapter 1, verse 9, John was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. In chapter 1, verse 9, John hears a loud voice as of a trumpet behind him saying, What you see, write in a book. So John turned to see the voice, and he saw the Son of Man walking in the midst of the lampstands. After which, he heard the Lord dictate to the angels the seven letters to the seven churches. Then, chapter 4, verse 1, after these things. So what is the after these things? What does the these things refer to? What John saw, chapters 1, 2, and 3. It's simply a chronological marker signifying a sequence in John's vision. Not a brand new vision. It's after these things. The vision continues. Now, if you grew up like, uh, like I did, and all you ever heard as you were growing up was a premillennial, if you understand these terms, premillennial, dispensational, Tim LaHaye left behind version of these things, then after these things refers to the church age. There's letters to the seven churches, speaking of the whole church age, and then come up here is a reference to the rapture. Now, for guys who pride themselves on their literalism, as dispensationalists often do, that is quite a stretch. That is quite the stretch. Notice the emphasis here on John's seeing and hearing. We're going to see this again when we look at the Old Testament foundation for this passage again in Daniel chapter 7. Seeing and hearing. In apocalyptic literature, there's, a, there's an emphasis on seeing and hearing. What is seen, what is seen, is quite often meant as symbolic or pointing to some reality. But after these things is merely a sequential marker. Uh, it's not intending to point to something. After these things is a sequential marker for John in the course of the vision. After he saw in chapters 1, 2, and 3, John on the Isle of Patmos in the first century was called up then to see what must take place next. He was called up in the spirit, just as Ezekiel was. Called up in the spirit, just as Jeremiah was. So after having heard the Lord address the churches, John looked and behold now a door standing open in heaven. So John, the church, are those letters not... Um, originally intended in that sense to, the, or to be pointing to the whole church age, though the letters themselves, the addresses themselves are representative letters meant for all the churches, not referring exclusively to the church age. And come up here does not mean that the church, the whole church was raptured. Simply a chronological marker. Turn with me to Ezekiel chapter one. And I want you to see the connection here between verse one and Ezekiel one. What begins to take place now in Revelation chapter 4 is visionary language, apocalyptic language. And we see apocalyptic, the same apocalyptic language in Ezekiel, in the other prophets as well. And where does that language come from? Look at Ezekiel chapter 1. Look there beginning at verse 1. Verse 1. Now it came to pass in the 30th year, in the fourth month, in the fifth day of the month, as I, Ezekiel, was among the captives by the river Chevar, that the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Does that sound familiar? The door opened in heaven in Revelation chapter four. He saw the heavens were opened and I saw visions of God. Ezekiel given a vision of the heavenly throne room, just like the apostle John in Revelation four. Verse 2, on the fifth day of the month, which was the fifth year of King Jehoiachin's captivity, the word of the Lord came expressly to Ezekiel the priest, the son of Buzi, in the land of the Chaldeans by the river Chevar. In the hand, and the hand of the Lord was upon him there. Now John, on the Isle of Patmos, is having a prophetic, apocalyptic vision like that of Ezekiel. The comparison to Ezekiel doesn't stop there. In Revelation chapter 10, John is going to receive a little book in which he uh, is instructed to eat. The book was full of lamentation and woe, and his stomach uh, was made bitter. But John is told to eat the book so that he may prophesy to the nations. Same thing happens to Ezekiel, right? Sounds like Ezekiel. Ezekiel in chapter 3, Ezekiel is told to eat the scroll that he may speak to the house of Israel. What do we see here? This is an apocalyptic prophetic revelation. Apocalyptic prophetic revelation given to Ezekiel. 
Here in Ezekiel chapter one, given to John in Revelation chapter four. Look at verse four. Ezekiel says, verse four, then, or after these things, it's a chronological marker. Then I looked and behold, same language that we see in Revelation four. A whirlwind was coming out of the north, a great cloud with raging fire engulfing itself and brightness was all around it and radiating out of its mist like the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. And from within it, came the likeness of four living creatures. You see similarities here, don't you? And this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Each one had four faces. Each one had four wings. All sounds familiar. Tremendous and frankly, unavoidable connections between what Ezekiel sees and what John sees. And what Ezekiel sees and what Daniel sees and what Isaiah sees. We're gonna look at these texts beginning next week. So what's happening in Revelation 4 then? John is serving a prophetic function being given an apocalyptic vision intended for revelation to God's people. John is serving a prophetic function. Turn back to Revelation 4 with me. Revelation 4. In verse 1, the apostle John now receiving a prophetic apocalyptic Vision. After these things, verse 1, I looked and behold a door standing open in heaven. What does that sound like? Ezekiel chapter 1, right? Like Ezekiel, John now peering through an opening in heaven, into heaven. And as he looked, verse 1, literally the voice, the first which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me. The voice, the first which I heard. In other words, the voice that I heard back in Revelation chapter 1, verse 10. If you flip back to Revelation chapter 1 and look at verse 10, John hears a voice as of a trumpet saying, I am the Alpha and the Omega. Who was the voice? The Lord Jesus Christ. That voice back in Revelation chapter 4 saying, come up here and I will show you things which must, must take place after this. Now, there's even an allusion here to the apocalyptic vision of Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2. It's also a text we'll look at. Where Daniel, Daniel chapter 2, describes the visions of his head while on his bed, he describes them as what must come to pass after this. In other words, the vision that Nebuchadnezzar is given in Daniel chapter 2 is a vision, Daniel says, of what must come to pass after this. Daniel translates after this to mean in the latter days. So Nebuchadnezzar in Daniel chapter 2 has, a, has an apocalyptic vision. And he's given a vision of what must take place in the latter days. So what's going on here between these uh, prophetic visions in the Old Testament? Now John receiving a prophetic vision in the New Testament, Revelation chapter 4. Well, as the Lord concludes his direct address to the churches, he resumes now his direct address to John. The letter opens, the book of the Revelation opens with the Lord Jesus Christ with the voice of a trumpet speaking to the apostle John. The Lord then addresses the seven churches, having concluded his direct address to the seven churches, now comes back to the apostle John and says, come up here, I need to show you what's going to take place after this. He heard the voice like a trumpet in chapter 1, verse 19, charging John with a prophetic responsibility, saying in chapter 1, verse 19, write the things which you have seen, the things which are, and the things which will take place after this. In other words, in the latter days. So now the Lord comes back to John after addressing the churches, and he summons John into the heavenly realm, saying, come up here, and I will show you things which must must take place after this. How does Daniel interpret after this? the latter days. How are we to understand after this? He's speaking of the latter days, the days in which we now are in. The latter days refers to our days. Paul says that perilous times will come, and in fact, perilous times have come. We are in the days of perilous times. What were the latter days to Nebuchadnezzar? The latter days were our days. The days, the latter days to Nebuchadnezzar, think with me now, were the days in which the small stone, like our brother talked about this morning, the small stone that crushed the statue 
having crushed the statue, that small stone grows and grows until it becomes a great mountain that fills the entire earth. Those are the days in which we live. What is the small stone? It's the Lord Jesus Christ beginning the kingdom, inaugurating the kingdom. That kingdom then, as a mustard seed, That kingdom grows and grows and grows now and has become a great mountain that at the end, at the consummation, when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back in his glory, that kingdom will fill the entire earth. It will be an everlasting kingdom, kingdom made without hands. And that small stone crushes Nebuchadnezzar's statue. And when did that begin? When did it happen? When did that, when was that initiated? At the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. The stone is our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, at that point, John himself may actually have been temporarily raptured. (laughs) Verse two, John says, immediately I was in the spirit and behold, a throne set in heaven and one sat on the throne. Now, John, at this point, verse two, is called by Jesus Christ into the very throne room of God, into the heavenly temple the one that Moses was shown on the mountain. And he was called into the very holy of holies where the throne of God is. Now, Paul would say in 2 Corinthians chapter 12 of his own vision of heaven, Paul would say, whether in the body, I do not know. Whether out of the body, I do not know. God knows, but such a one was caught up to the third heaven. Paul doesn't know whether it was in his body or not in his body. He just knows that he was caught up. He says, he simply knows that he was caught up into paradise. And John now, like the prophets who went before him, like Paul who went before him, is brought into the heavenly council. And Paul or John is going to receive revelation for the people of God. John is serving a prophetic function. It's very reminiscent now of Ezekiel himself who is brought out in the spirit. So it's this throne room then this throne room scene that becomes a base of operations, if you will, for the rest of the letter. It's from here, and particularly from the scroll in the hand of Jesus Christ in chapter 5, verse 1, that all of the visions from chapter 6 to chapter 22 are taken. It all begins with a vision of God seated on a throne in heaven. And John says, behold, a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. I'd submit to you, brothers, as we think about this text in particular, uh, and I know you are like me in the sense that I can't help but think about this text with a little bit of sanctified imagination. You know, what must that scene be like? John invited into the very throne room of God to see glories that are beyond our capability to understand. Try as you might In your wildest dreams, you cannot surpass the the beauty and the majesty of the reality of that vision. So as much as we sit and we try to imagine what that must look like, and we we look at the the, the star, the stones, and just the beauty of that scene, uh, our imaginations won't ever do it justice. (laughs) Uh, We're going to have to see it with our own eyes. Our imaginations will always fall short. This is one with sanctified imagination. You can't possibly overdo it. You can't overdo it. It's a vision that we're going to take up next week if the Lord allows. So brothers and sisters, as we consider now next week the enthroned God and the Lord Jesus Christ at his right hand, our hearts need to be raptured with thoughts of this reality as we live in this life. As we face difficulty and tribulation and suffering, our hearts need to be filled with a sanctified imagination of that glorious scene in heaven where the Lord is enthroned. Our desires need to be captivated with the splendor of it. Our affections enthralled with the glory of it. May our enthroned king be the sum and substance of all our hope and faith. It's that vision that gets you through difficulty. It's that vision that helps you to persevere. May that vision be so all-consuming that the next time you're faced with temptation to compromise, where that 
temporary pleasure or the temporary pleasure that sin affords, may it be seen in the light of that reality such that that temporary pleasure will be seen for the cheap and filthy knockoff that it really is. And that we would persevere in faithfulness to him who loved us and gave himself for us. That's how we get through this life in perseverance, amen? A vision of the Lord Jesus Christ. Pray with me. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you for this chapter, these chapters. We thank you for this revelation. We thank you, Lord, that in your infinite wisdom, you have provided for us uh, what we need or to persevere. As you met with your disciples in the upper room on the night in which you were betrayed, Lord, you gave to them encouragement, told them ahead of time what would happen so that when those things came to pass, they would not be made to stumble, but rather would respond to those things that were coming to pass with great faith and trust in you because you told them in advance those things would happen. We see now a throne room, a, a door opened in heaven and through the revelation given to the apostle John, we see you enthroned, ruling and reigning, sovereign over all history. And we rejoice, Lord, that you the one who has loved us, the one who has promised to work all things together for our good, you are the one in control of all our circumstances. And Lord, we know that these things are to be embraced through faith. We, we walk not by sight, we walk by faith. Uh, but Lord, embracing them in faith, um, we embrace them that our feet may not be made to stumble. And we trust in you. And we pray, Lord, that by your spirit, you would cause us to apprehend these sights in faith that we might live for you without compromise, faithful, and persevering to the end for your glory. Thank you for this time together tonight in your word. In Jesus' name, amen.